Well, good evening and welcome. As uh, Professor Pavel reminded you, I have the capacity to turn unpleasant topics pleasant and pleasant topics unpleasant, as I rendered with Gandhi. So let's see how far I can go with rape and redemption. Well, welcome. So this talk is on rape and redemption, the changing landscape of gender discourses in contemporary India. Let's dive right in. Now, Mahepalpur is not a place you will find on many tourist guides to India. Once a village, now a cluster of cheap hotels, roadside restaurants, and bus stops, around a major road junction to the outskirts of Delhi, it is a place many pass by, but few seek out. The huge new billion dollar international airport terminal lies a mile or so away across construction sites, wasteland, and rubbish tips, obscured now by thick city smog, a mixture of smoke from wood fires and pollution. Tens of thousands of people pass Mahibalpur every day, few stop. But it was here, in the dirt beside a ramp leading to the flyover carrying an eight-lane highway at 10.25 PM precisely, on the 16th of December 2012, that a bus briefly stopped, and a semi-conscious woman and her male companion were dumped, naked, bleeding, and badly injured on the ground. This being India, a crowd quickly gathered. Passing cars slowed. After 40 minutes, 40 minutes, someone called the police. The police fetched sheets from a nearby cheap hotel to cover the couple and they were taken to a hospital. It was discovered at the hospital that the woman had been raped by multiple men and savaged so brutally with an iron rod that her intestines poured out of her vagina. In a few days, she would die in Singapore. In a Singapore hospital surrounded by specialists quickly summoned by the Indian government, and among a burgeoning cloud of questions surrounding India's governance. Since that horrible evening, people have called her Damini, which means lightning in Hindi, and her death provoked thousands to take to India's streets, furious at endemic and unchecked violence against women. In the three years since this horrific event, there has been a great deal of comment, not just in Western, but in South Asian media as well, about what the nature of modern India is. Many appear surprised to have suddenly discovered something that appears to contradict the booming, shining India story. Many have been spurred to ask, why does India treat its women so badly? And this is the entry point of my discussion today. Over the past few years, the very ugly specter of sexual violence against women has become the daily staple of news featuring the Indian subcontinent. A cursory scan of India's newspapers over the past five years, and not even headlines, throw up the following stories. A 10-month-old raped by a neighbor in Delhi. An 18-month-old raped and abandoned in the streets of Calcutta. A 14-year-old raped and murdered in a police station in Uttar Pradesh. A husband facilitating his wife's gang rape in Howrah. A 65-year-old grandmother raped in Kharagpur. Sexual violence as an everyday possibility has become attached to the Indian cultural character, and it is being loosely called rape culture. According to a 2014 Reuters statistic, a rape is reported every 21 minutes in India. In this paper, this evening with you, I intend to explore the anatomy of India's so-called rape culture and consider some of the social, historical, and legal contexts within which sexual violence functions so routinely in everyday Indian life. In so doing, I hope also to touch upon some of the changing modalities, some of the changing ideas of modernity, gender, and public engagement in India. Now, I think all of us know that it's been a common, almost tediously predictable practice among commentators on India to describe the continent as a land of contrasts. 
the sort of magical land weaving through tradition and modernity where a ranked female army officer can march with hennaed hands. Just a couple of days ago, Barack Obama quipped about the peculiarly Indian serendipity of a tea seller's son welcoming the US president in his position as the country's prime minister. Only possible in India, said Obama, hugging Indian Premier Narendra Modi at India's Republic Day celebrations this year, just a couple of days ago. But in the winter of 2012, the sudden breathtaking force of the Delhi gang rape incident shattered those conceptual binaries with ear-splitting clarity. As I hope to show you today, it is difficult, indeed irresponsible, to remain blithely ensconced in this old safety blanket of bumper binar, uh, sort of bumper sticker binaries of India. Traditional versus modern, spiritual versus commercial, rich versus poor, and stay blinkered to the, to the complex realities of these vast and varied nations. I often tell my students, some of whom are here today, that India can only be studied in snapshots, in vignettes, as fragments. Today I will attempt to explore the story of India's rape culture through a study of several such fragments, such vignettes. I was careful in my choice of title for this talk tonight. In calling this a discussion of rape and redemption, the changing landscape of gender discourses in India, I hope to touch upon precisely those aspects of Indian life. Rape, the landscape literally, discourses gender and so on. So some of the main thematic hooks on which my discussion today hangs are public space, socioeconomic change, public engagement, female agency, patriarchy, law, caste, and class. I will argue that these intricate forces of change push against but also engender new forms of inequalities in India. My intention is to introduce, contextualize, and critique elements of these social processes. And then I will leave open a generous period, I hope, for questions and answers so that we may discuss uh, any particular ideas in more details as you find interesting. So what does the actual landscape of modern India look like? My argument is that India no longer exists as a rural versus urban configuration, but is rather a matrix of spaces in transition. <clears throat> and within this matrix, extreme rural and crisply urban are fictions. Now let's go back to the locus and the people involved in Damini's rape. Arrive at almost any of the new airports being built across India today, outside its major cities, and head to the heritage sites or the better long established hotels, and you will pass through a Mahipalpur. These are the gray zones around India's rapidly expanding urban centers. Little happens here that makes it into local newspapers, let alone the world press. Yet, I believe, India's myriad Mahipalpurs hold the key to understanding modern India's identity. These are spaces which can be understood, I believe, in social scientist Mark Selzer's formulation as pathological public spaces. These are spaces, non-places, spaces that are only to be passed by or moved through, not lived in not lingered or experienced in any anthropological sense of place making through any investment of a, excuse me of a shared cultural meaning these spaces do not produce conviviality they produce cultural voids there is a gendered connotation to this historically and globally cities as sites of production and consumption are gendered in their very imagination Cities are not neutral spaces and have often been planned and designed keeping in mind the male worker citizen. The gendered nature of cities and urbanization manifests itself in the exclusions, in the lack of opportunities and kinds of infrastructure and services which impact women's access. Thus, Poor connectivity through public transport or poor access to public toilets can have a real impact 
on the way that women are in, and girls are able to move around any city. Places like Mahipam Palpur, Ramdas Colony, Dwarka, Gurgaon, sites whose names came up during the Delhi gang rape case, were involved in various ways. Either they were the home of the rapist or the victim herself or the site of the rape. They are not Indian cities in a real sense, but Indian urban spaces in transition, devoid of any collective settled cultural identity. The only marks that inscribe such non-places are pathological tensions. Tensions that more or less grind themselves out on the bodies of women. In these zones of cultural identity, male identity is often constructed through control and the literal, often violent branding of a woman's body. A woman's body, we might remind ourselves here, has universally and historically been a repository of tradition. National identities are always feminized. Mother India, Mother Russia, Marianne, Britannia. And therefore, wherever community identity becomes foggy, such insecurities are often played out through a toxic desire for domination and subjugation of the female body. On that dark December night in 2012, the band of rapists in Mahipalpur had showed Damini her place in more than one meaning of that word. In that same vein, one of the subfields, a subgroup of protest which emerged surrounding Damini's celebrated rape case was the right to egalitarian spaces. This movement, these are posters from a largely Hindi-based movement that emerged around the incident, and I'll explain what that is. Uh, this was called the Matar Gashti movement, a Hindi word I hadn't myself heard until then. Matar Gashti means loitering. According to this movement, their own manifesto claims, loitering is an expression of freedom, vibrancy, happiness, consent. Loitering, they say, should be an essential part of every Indian's life. I quote from their manifesto here. Fearlessly roam on the roads, sprawl in the park, jump onto buses, jump onto metros and trains, or just laze around at a tea stall. I may be anyone, they write, a man, a woman, transgender. Fearlessly, I can be out at any time, traveling by public transport or in my own car. Fearlessly, I wear whatever clothes I like, and regardless of which region of India I belong, north, south, the northeast, or anywhere else. In the Damini case, while all sympathy lies naturally with the 23-year-old victim, a young physiotherapy student who was the victim of this gruesome attack, some focus on the socioeconomic background of her assailants highlights a lot about the condition of India today. These were not hardened, serialized sex criminals. They weren't psychopaths or brutalized men from the margins of society. Nothing quite so easy as that. Their backgrounds were, worryingly, like tens of millions of Indian men. These are clips from newspaper reports around the time that these men were being sentenced. The man on the right there is one of the main accused, Ram Singh, who later hanged himself in his cell. So these four who remained were actually tried. But uh, let me sort of go on to talking about uh, the point I'm making here about socioeconomics. Now, Ravi Das Colony, where all of them lived, was not an underbelly of Delhi, as one local newspaper described it. A few hundred homes crammed onto a patch of land flanked by a road, a temple, and a recently restored medieval Muslim tomb. It lies like an outpost of another poorer India amidst the relatively well-off suburbs to the south of the city. For Ram and Mukesh Singh, the main accused in the case, Ravidas colony had been home for most of their lives. Ram earned a living as a driver of a bus that carried school children. So remember, it was a bus that carried school children on which this rape took place. The two brothers had grown up on a small homestead in Karauli, 
a remote eastern part of the state of Rajasthan, which is very familiar to people who've traveled to India. Rajasthan is picture postcard India of camels and sand dunes. They attended a local school with few facilities and an often absent teacher. They came to Delhi in 1997. By 1997, India was beginning to boom after the reforms of the early 1990s had injected a new capitalist energy into the sclerotic, quasi-socialist, quasi-feudal economy, and their landless laborer parents tried to, uh, decided to try their luck in the capital. Now, one of the most striking elements of the Delhi gang rape case is the similarity in the backgrounds of the victim and her killers. Damani's family, too, like those of her assailants, came from close to the bottom of India's still quite tenacious caste hierarchy. Her father, Badrinath, who you can see on top there during an interview on TV, like the Singh brother's father, had left his remote ancestral village for the capital, Delhi, in search of a better life. For both families, if life in the city was better than the brutal poverty of their villages, the improvement was only marginal. Both the 17-year-old involved in the rape, known as Raju, and Thakur, another teenager, also involved in the Damini gang rape, they had their own troubled histories. The eldest of five children, this teenager Raju, was born to a destitute day laborer with mental health issues and his wife in a village 150 miles east of Delhi, in the vast northern state of Uttar Pradesh, which has 180 million inhabitants and socioeconomic indicators often worse than those in sub-Saharan Africa. As in rural Rajasthan, where the Singh brothers came from, women in the countryside of Uttar Pradesh suffer systematic sexual harassment and often violence. Rape is common and gang rape is frequent. Victims are habitually blamed for supposedly enticing their attackers. All male village councils called khaps force rape victims very often to marry their assailants. Others are encouraged to kill themselves rather than live with the social stigma of being dishonored. In these areas, police rarely register a complaint, let alone investigate. This is where these men came from. In Delhi, the Singh brothers and the teenagers Raju and Thakur, and even Damini and her parents, lived in what sociologists call, and as I've mentioned to you, transition zones. Raju and Thakur lived in a rough neighborhood in Delhi called Trilokpuri. Trilokpuri later on has also been in the news for communal riots, some of you may recall. On the margin of Delhi's sprawl across the northern bank of the stinking, if still holy river, Yamuna. Created as a new home for slum dwellers cleared from Delhi's old city in the 1970s, areas like Trilokpuri, Ravidas colony, hover between the urban and the rural. Look at these images here. These are areas in a city where buffalo graze amid plastic bags and rubbish in the wastelands that separate poorly built cement blocks of flats. Damini's family lived in Dwaraka, an area where the ragged reality of India's journey to prosperity is very obvious. A narrow flyover takes a stream of vehicles over a railway where packed trains pass slowly between strips of wasteland strewn with rubbish, feces, and thin-ribbed cows. Everywhere there are people, laborers streaming in from their makeshift huts to work on a series of unfinished skeletal luxury flats that will be sold to the newly wealthy. Women buying or carrying baskets of vegetables, young men doing little except play with their cheap mobile phones, some beggars. The four rapists were all representative of a substantial element of contemporary Indian society. The median age in India is 25, with two-thirds of India's 1.2 billion population under the age of 35. They were semi-skilled and poorly educated, like so many other products of the country's failing education systems. They were migrants from the country to the town. Four of the millions of individuals who over recent decades have converted an almost entirely rural country into an increasingly urbanized one. There was absolutely nothing extraordinary about them 
until that horrible night on the 16th of December, 2012. Another very ordinary thread that held both victim and perpetrators together is that migratory pull to India's capital, New Delhi. It has long been known, well ahead of 2012, that Delhi has had a problem with sexual violence. And statistics back up anecdotal evidence. For years, every few days, the media reported a serious sexual assault, though usually tucked away on the metro pages of broadsheets in India and just recounted in a few dry paragraphs because it was just so repetitive, it's just so common in Delhi. Every few weeks, there would be an attack, often a gang rape. Some would receive more attention, but after the expressions, the very predictable expressions of concern by police officers or activists and Delhi's elected officials, these issues would soon disappear. Few of the incidents ended in charges, almost none in a trial. The conviction rate for rapes, according to 2011 statistics, languished around the 25% mark, just about a quarter. And then in Delhi, what is best known is that there is a daily low-level harassment in public places. This is simply accepted as part of the life of living in Delhi. Suggestive comments and wandering hands on buses, photographing or filming with phones, being followed and even chased were, again, 2011 polls showed, regularly encountered by 80%, 80% of women in the city. According to one survey, this molestation, euphemistically and highly annoyingly known in India as Eve teasing, was seen as harmless by a majority of men in Delhi. A high proportion of Delhi's police too are recruited from the surrounding rural areas and the big poor conservative states of Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Haryana and Rajasthan. Their attitudes in inevitably reflect those of their home communities. These are very similar, these areas are very similar to Karoli, Aurangabad, Trilokpuri, and other places where Dhamini's attackers had grown up or spent many years. Now look at this recent poster by the community wing of Delhi police. This, I think, encapsulates the, this conundrum that is represented by law enforcement authorities in India. This is a poster which is supposed to offer redemption for the poor Indian child. And what the Delhi police suggest is help him learn how to chop onions. This fundamentally means that help, instead of educating a boy, that possibility does not exist, it's privileging child labor. Chopping onions is a very common image which reflects sort of the, the thousands and thousands of young boys and girls who are recruited by roadside restaurants or food stalls to indeed chop onions for food. Teach him to chop onions, so privileged child labor, otherwise the only option available to the Delhi police seems to be someone will teach him how to chop a head. Now Delhi police received considerable flack from social activists and children's right activists for this poster but they are not alone to blame, and they do not alone reflect this mentality. The immediate aftermath of the Delhi gang rape saw Indian politicians outdo themselves for the most lunatic of suggestions for addressing the issue of sex crime in India. I'm sure that any, most of you who read anything about the news emerging from India around the Delhi gang rape read some of these suggestions that why didn't she refer to her rapist as brothers? They would have immediately stopped raping her and so on. But here are some of them. It's probably a blessing if you can't read them clearly. It's good for your blood pressure, I'd say. <laughs> so let me just summarize some of the highlights for you. Local politicians attributed the wave of attacks to women behaving immodestly, no surprise there, wearing provocative clothes, or the amount of junk food that young men were eating. Chinese food apparently seemed to be the biggest offender in these very intelligent arguments. Um, some called for the age of marital consent to be lowered so as to prevent the possibility of immoral thoughts. So brother or husband? The fierce debate for months after the attack, setting conservatives who blamed westernization against liberals blaming reactionary sexist and patriarchal attitudes faded only to be rekindled in fits and bursts 
when incidents of sexual violence came to the newsrooms from across the country, often from the hinterlands of Haryana and Uttar Pradesh, but also very disturbingly frequently from the state of West Bengal. India's cultural and educational hub since its development as the British Indian capital province over 300 years ago. West Bengal today has turned into another arena of nebulous transition, engendering its own peculiar pathologies of space and identity. This is where West Bengal is. Now, few other regions were as dramatically shaped by the encounter with British colonialism as Bengal. For much of the 18th and 19th centuries, Bengal, and in particular the city of Calcutta, which is known as Kolkata today, was the epicenter of British India, giving rise to forces and trends both destructive and creative, which decisively shaped modern India. Accompanying the consolidation of a permanent settlement act, entrenching a strata of feudatory landowners while immiserizing the peasantry in Bengal, implications of which are felt very palpably to date, there was also a growth of modern industry and trading houses and a very vibrant urban culture epitomized by the city of Calcutta, which then shuddered into dysfunction during 30 years of communist-led rule, which lasted until only a few years ago. An economic policy which devalues wealth creation and fails to focus on creating meaningful employment opportunities for the young can only cause despair. And thus, even as this communist left front repeatedly won elections in Bengal, it failed dangerously to read the growing mood of despondency and anger in Bengal. The current ruling party in Bengal, the Trinomul Congress, with a female chief minister, Mamata Banerjee, has failed to enthuse. And their protection of women's rights has been appalling. This administration continues to rail against the legacy of the misrule of the left which preceded it and discrimination from the center in India, the central government, but proposes no remedial agenda. While Delhi's pathologized zones of transition are infected with voids of identity, in Bengal, the old comfortable staples of middle class tepidness and Bengali intellectualism have been replaced by stark tensions, constructed and consolidated by rapid economic decline and the shrinking of opportunity across the board, creating a peculiar situation where marginal social groups vastly exceed and outnumber any discernible demographic core of privilege. The Bengal situation serves to remind us that in today's India, despite popular notions, class Class as an economic signifier often overrides caste or a ritualistic signifier of identity. Now let me segue here into the famous 2014 Jadavpur University sexual assault case to illustrate this point. A female student of this premier Calcutta based university was assaulted by 10 hostile boys and her friend beaten up, her male friend beaten up. The students, irrespective of political affiliation, demanded a fair and impartial investigation. They were not heard, and the entire incident was dismissed by the university's vice chancellor. When the students demanded justice, they were beaten up by Calcutta police and ruling party cadres. Three students were critically injured, numerous others hospitalized, many were arrested. For many of the, these students, they were mostly undergraduates, it was the first time that they were involved in anything political. This incident was widely reported across news media. If you look at the image at the bottom there, this is a group of undergraduates from the university joined by other undergraduates from other colleges and universities in Calcutta, demanding the resignation of the vice chancellor who dismissed uh, the incident of assault. Um, as I said, this incident was very, very widely reported across news media, social media and created a tremendous sway, particularly within social media globally, birthing battle cries for change under the banner of hoax cholera. You see the hashtag there? Which means, let there be noise. Mm -hmm. The West Bengal chief minister and a baying conservative press dubbed the incident and the protests surrounding it as 
created the self-indulgent fantasies of elite university students high on marijuana and Western music. <laughs> Let's look at the issues at play here. Jadavpur University is an elite institution. There's no doubt about it if we, if we consider the university to be one of the advanced centers of learning in India. But, and this is important in an Indian context, that does not render its students socially or economically elite, nor were the demands of the students elitist. They simply wanted to file a case at the local police station. Their cries for justice did not stem from a status gained either by the institution they belonged to or the families they came from. Jadavpur University has one of the lowest tuition fees of any institution in India, about rupee, Indian rupees 25 a month, which is 50 Canadian cents or less. Rickshaw pullers, tea stall owners, landless farmers are able to and do routinely send their children to this university with dreams of better futures. Of the students who were beaten up, most came from rural backgrounds. Newspapers reported of a seriously injured student who was admitted to a hospital for a number of days and who requested that his parents not be informed, not only because they would be worried about his health, but because they would be bankrupted by the cost of his medical treatment even at the general ward of a subsidized government hospital where he lay. He was the first in his extended family to have ever completed high school. This young man expressed no regret in compromising his professional future by courting arrest and possibly a police record. According to the quote in the newspaper, he said, justice is not the preserve of politicians and policemen. What's the use of my university education if I can't even lodge an FIR, a first investigation report, at my local police station? Now, this is a good point to enter into a broader discussion of agency, and agency within the state of play of patriarchy in modern India. In November 2013, a journalist at the investigative news challenge, uh, channel Tehelka, which means sensation, accused its celebrity founder editor, author Tarun Tejpal, of having sexually assaulted her in a public elevator in Goa. The massive mobilization of public opinion around this incident reopened in very vibrant ways the questions and debates around agency in familiar and unfamiliar ways. There you see Tarun Tejpal and one of his interesting quotes, which I agree with actually. <laughs> <coughs> Feminists across the globe have long asserted women's agency in context of sexual violence by attempting to desexualize rape in law and in everyday life. Taken out of patriarchal or sort of male power-centered discourses of honor, rape is merely an act of violence that violates bodily integrity. This delicate balance between two opposing notions, on the one hand, that sexual violence has a distinctive character, it is more humiliating, more paralyzing than physically less harmful actions, and on the other, that sexual violence is merely another kind of physical violence. This is the razor's edge occupied by feminist understandings of rape. Poised in this breathtakingly liminal borderline space, Indian feminists too find themselves faced with articulations on agency from patriarchal and misogynist positions while simultaneously engaging in an internal debate with other feminist voices. Now let's consider two kinds of positions that emerged in the aftermath of the charge of sexual assault made by the Tehelka journalist against its founder editor Tarun Tejpal. Good cartoon that emerged around it. One, the increasingly confidently, even arrogantly expressed view by some men, men particularly male journalists, that sexuality and desire are natural and powerful instincts. That to repress them is to spell the death of creativity. That even innocent encounters now ran the risk of being labeled as harassment. That terrified men following Tarun Tejpal's persecution would now legitimately hesitate to employ women at all. I mean, anyone could accuse the poor things of sexual harassment. The other, from the opposite end of the spectrum, held that the complainant ought to have gone to the police immediately and invoked the criminal law on rape, 
rather than seeing the act as she did within the frame of sexual harassment at the workplace and addressing her employer. The only reason that this story actually became public was because these emails sent by the journalist to her managing director were leaked. A top Indian journalist, Palash Mehrotra, in what may be the most obnoxious pronouncement in the entire sorry media spectacle wrote, and I quote, if a man offers to go down on a woman, is he offering a submissive sexual favor or a demanding one? The bedroom has become criminalized, unquote. In this way, a well-regarded, a well-respected journalist states with extreme clarity two main tenets of the worldview of the entitled Indian male. One, I will choose where to have sex and wherever I have sex is my bedroom. If that place be a public elevator, so be it. Two, it is my prerogative to offer a sexual favor or ask for one, to offer to be submissive or to be dominant. It is immaterial what the woman thinks of it, whether I repulse her, frighten her, or just leave her stone cold with boredom. <laughs> this is the framework within which most sexual violence and sexual harassment by acquaintances take place. A heterosexual male framework which dissolves all distinctions between sex, desire, and violence. Another very well-respected Indian journalist called Charu Nibedita in his piece urged that Tarun Tejpal as a novelist be placed, he writes, among masters like Fyodor Dostoevsky. The purpose of this mystifying recommendation, it turns out, is to permit Tejpal into the hallowed ranks of eminent men who have had sex without the consent of women involved or with women so powerless that their consent was irrelevant. He lists Neruda, Karl Marx, and Roman Polanski. There are some immediate questions here. What if we do not share his assessment of Tejpal's genius? Are all men permitted these peccadillos or only giants like Neruda and Polanski? And what if we believe, as I firmly do, that Tarun Tejpal is an embarrassingly bad writer. Then, do I have the right now to legitimately pay for his blood? <coughs> Two, unlike with Neruda, in the case of Polanski and Tejpal, the women involved have not faded into history, but have been inconveniently loud and demanding of justice. What are we to say to these women? Remind them of their assailant's genius? This kind of I think the only way to describe it is Hugh Hefnerian exaltation <laughs> of heterosexual male desire, and remember, only heterosexual male desire, by self-styled intellectuals rankles all the more when one considers the dense and textured terrain that activists for women's rights have for long inhabited on the questions of sexuality, desire, and agency. Now, within both social activism and academia, there have been agonizing, complicated debates on these questions, and not just in India. The focus shifted from sexuality as violence in the 1980s to sexuality as transgressive desire in the 1990s, and then back again. Feminists in India, for instance, have debated whether pornography is necessarily violence against women and rejected censorship for a variety of reasons. They have argued that rather than banning obscenity and pornography, Indians need to ensure the proliferation of more secular desires of sexual pleasure, um, secular discourses, pardon me, of sexual pleasure and desire. But now, in the first decades of the 21st century, we find ourselves rethinking the operations of power in the proliferation of pornography that is both misogynist and violent. We find ourselves wondering about the implications of the very easy, inexpensive, indeed free availability of such porn, and struggle to understand the layers of violence involved when a woman is not only beaten, but made to watch porn on mobile phones even as she's being raped, as happened in one of the gang rapes in 2013. Indians have woken up rather belatedly to the need to understand and deconstruct masculinity, to recognize that there are dominant and subordinate masculinities, and to ask 
what the relationship is between masculinities, patriarchies, and femininities. Indians began to recognize that sex is not simply biological, that genders are many, that genders are fluid. Through all of this, a related set of questions continue to trouble India regarding the role of the state and the law in dealing with sexual identities and sexual violence. Over the decades, from the open letter on the infamous Mathura judgment by the Supreme Court in 1979, which followed a very celebrated, indeed notorious case, which decreed that a sexually habituated woman could not be raped. Raped. So sexually habituated woman by Indian law simply means a woman who's not a virgin. This Supreme Court ordinance had declared that a, a woman who was not a virgin just simply couldn't be raped. There was a great deal of protest around it. These are images from protests around 73, 74, around that case. There were innumerable draft legislations on sexual assault prepared by different sections of the women's movement, but none of them were taken seriously by the legislature. These drafts, arising from intense discussion within the women's movement, tried to redress the utterly patriarchal law on rape at the time that recognized only penile penetration of the vagina as rape and nothing more. While other forms of penetration came under something called outraging a woman's modesty, a considerably lesser crime. In one recorded case of a three-year-old being penetrated by a finger, Judges debated whether a small child could be held to have any modesty at all. These debates since the 1980s have not been restricted to academic seminar rooms, nor, nor did they originate there exclusively. In a recognizable interplay between theory, practice, and everyday life, the transformative collective power of chain challenges to patriarchy, misogyny, and heteronormativity have percolated to a kind of ground level common sense in India now. The decades since the 1980s in India, which saw some of the most influential social mobilization against rape, against marital violence and women's legal rights, have been marked by a range of interventions. Workshops in rural areas, mass political struggles on varied issues, discussions in urban classrooms, all of these have been the medium of circulation of such ideas. Ideas carried by activists, by students and teachers, parents, and children of all genders. The electrifying and massive protests that galvanized the country after the December 16th rape case and murder in 2012, both in big cities and small towns across India, were a dramatic manifestation of this ground level transformation of common sense. Slogans and statements, not only in English, revealed feminist understandings about the autonomy and mobility of women. Young women on the street were militant and unafraid now. There were as many men as women expressing their anger. And in their class composition, protesters seemed to range from lower middle class to middle class they were by no means exclusively an articulate upper class elite. And I'd like to remind you here again of the Matargashti or loitering movement I'd referred to uh, a little while ago, which was conducted entirely in Hindi and included in their published manifesto, not just women, but the LGBT community, senior citizens and disabled Indians. The momentum of the protests yielded two historic documents. One, a visionary report, and the other, a strange mishmash of a piece of legislation. So what are these? The first one, the Justice Verma Committee report, which I will refer to as the JVC report, of January 2013, was widely recognized as a paradigm shift in understanding sexual violence in India. And it reflected the inputs of the women's movement in India and the queer movement amongst others. The Criminal Law Amendment Act of 2013, which followed the JVC, is an absurd anomalous thing marked by an arrogant blindness towards the entire charge debate that preceded it and which very deliberately, barefacedly ignored the JVC report. The JVC report recommended recognition in law of marital rape and permitting the prosecution of members of the security forces, the Indian military, accused of sexual assault and rape, which some of you know is a, a major sort of another axis of debate, particularly in the northeast 
of India and Kashmir. The determination of consent to any sexual act, this report held, was not to be affected by the previous sexual experience of the victim or the relationship between the victim and the accused. The definition of rape itself was to be changed. The crime of rape was retained as a separate offense, but was expanded to include any non-consensual penetration of a sexual nature. The committee recommended that non-penetrative forms of sexual contact should be regarded as sexual assault. The sexual nature of an act to, to be determined on the basis of its circumstances. New offenses would be recognized, such as verbal sexual assault, stalking, and acid attack. Most importantly, the JVC recommended gender neutrality of the victim, but not of the perpetrator, except in cases of custodial rape or rape in the context of a clear power differentiated situation, which means that women in authority or with custody over others could be accused of sexual assault or rape. Now, the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 2013 is in an entirely different kettle of fish. It does not recognize marital rape. It protects members of the security forces from prosecution of, for sexual assault. And it introduces the death penalty for rape, which was rejected, which was firmly rejected by the JVC. It does not accept the expanded definition of rape and retains sex-specific definitions for perpetrators. The perpetrator can only be male and the victim can only be female. The ordinance it replaced had swung to the other extreme. It had, excuse me, established the gender neutrality of the perpetrator, which in a misogynist society with high levels of violence against women would only further make women the target of the law rather than offering them protection. However, going back to seeing victims as only female is also problematic. For the new law thus refuses to recognize sexual assaults on men and transgender people and is deeply troubling, deeply problematic from a queer perspective. Apart from all of this, the relevant issue for Indians is that the expanded definition of rape in the new law is not accompanied by any gradation in the differentiation of sexual offenses. There is no differentiation in terms of severity of violence or the nature of the violence. Sociologist Pratiksha Bakshi pointed out in her critique of this act, said that the clubbing together of different forms of sexual assault as rape in the same sentencing structure essentially means that every offense on that list, from touching the breast of a person without consent to forcible penetration, can potentially be awarded the maximum sentence. Under a system, within which you are either guilty or not guilty, so it's like a pass-fail system, of one crime called rape with a very, very high penalty, the prospects of conviction now are so low that most defendants will plead not guilty. After all, even the December 16th rapist had pleaded not guilty under this law. So did the Helka editor Tarun Tejpal. And once the not guilty plea gets going, it's inevitably accompanied by a large-scale character assassination of the female complainant, a phenomenon we saw both in the December 16th trial and in the run-up to the Tejpal trial. So in the December 16th trial, there was one section of the press which pointed out the, the responsibility of Damini herself because she was out close to midnight with a male companion and watching an English film, Incidentally, Life of Pi. And in also the run-up to Tarun Tejpal. Uh, moreover, the word rape is extremely fraught and often does not match the victim's own assessment of what they have undergone. As the Tehelka journalist who accused Tarun Tejpal said in a statement to the media, and I think this is worth repeating in, at some length. This is what she said, and I quote, Perhaps the hardest part of this unrelentingly painful experience has been my struggle with taxonomy. I don't know if I'm ready to see myself as a rape victim or for my colleagues, friends, supporters, and critics to see me thus. It is not the victim that categorizes the crime. It is the law. In this case, the law is clear. What Mr. Tejpal did to me falls within the legal definition of rape. So these new laws on sexual violence in India, what do they give us? I believe 
that the new laws on rape and sexual harassment effectively compromised two very important spaces. One that was opened up by the 1997 Vishakha guidelines on sexual harassment, another important document produced by the Indian government, to recognize sexual harassment at the workplace as a civil offense. And two, the space for complainants themselves to decide the course of action in their own time. When she was assaulted by Tejpal during an official function, the complainant in the Tehelka case, whose court we have up here, saw it as sexual harassment in the workplace. And she started the process of pushing senior management to institute a committee according to Supreme Court guidelines. Tejpal, under pressure from her relentless attacks on his version of events, conceded and confessed to most of what she charged him with. A scenario was emerging in which the complainant was gradually driving Tejpal and the management committee into a public acknowledgement, a properly constituted inquiry and appropriate punishment. Up to this point, the complainant had some degree of control over how far and where to take her own campaign. But in the hollow din and blinding lights of the media circus that erupted after all her emails were somehow accidentally leaked, increasingly the question began to be asked from left and right in India. If this act is rape according to the new law, why is she not going to the police? Why are feminists speaking publicly on this issue? Why are they not pushing for police action? And sure enough, thanks to media pressure, the Goa police, where the incident occurred, took Suomoto action with a speed not normally shown by Indian police in such matters. And after that, the complainant had no control over the progress of the issue at all. The rapidity of the progress of this case, of course, is not matched in other instances. In general, once the Indian police take over, complainants must resign themselves to the endlessly prolonged processes entailed, as opposed to the relatively quicker procedures of internal sexual harassment committees. In the new law, what would previously have been understood by even feminists as sexual assault is now just rape. But more crucially, this new law now makes it mandatory for doctors to report to the police any knowledge of a criminal sexual act. And failure to report is punishable by a prison sentence. This means that once a woman who has been sexually assaulted goes to a doctor, she has no more control over whether or when to take it to the police. The question arises then, when women approach local organizations to report rape or sexual harassment and seek some recourse without necessarily going to the police, do the organizations now, and it seems that they do under this new law, become liable if they respect the women's wishes? This possibility has made many extremely uneasy. The assumption that the only justifiable recourse for a complainant is to invoke the law is, at least in my opinion, a betrayal of a secular ethic of respecting the agency of the victims and survivors of sexual assault. Of course, in cases of rape during caste and communal violence and state repression, we should understand the agency of raped women very differently. Recognizing the, the power of overarching structures of violence involved and large-scale intimidation. But surely this kind of fine-tuned and contextual understanding is precisely in keeping with any understanding of a modern society. So, then what is a good balanced set of options then in cases of sexual harassment and violence? The general agreement would be public acknowledgement of the act, the violator's punishment, and a sense of closure and justice for the complainant. All of this to be carried out in close accordance with the complainant's wishes so that he or she can control to the extent possible the pace of progress and the lengths to which she or he wishes to take it. But what constitutes making public then? One, we can make public in two ways. One of these is by bringing into public discussion matters that derive their power from secrecy, from whispering. This process can very powerfully destabilize 
establish notions of right and wrong, just and unjust, acceptable and non-acceptable behavior. The other way of making public is through making th something subject to legislative and state action. It seems to me that feminist politics in India has often conflated the two. Making public is seen to be effective only when legal action is taken. This recourse, however, rarely achieves the purpose of transforming social practices dangerous to women. While the former, making public, getting rid of silence, may achieve much more in terms of revolutionizing common sense. For instance, last year there was news of a university student in Delhi who demanded and got from her department the public humiliation of her supervisor who had molested her sexually. He had to tender a written and verbal apology to her before an entire gathered department and of course he was removed officially as her supervisor. She did not want it taken to the sexual harassment committee and her wishes were respected. In what way is she worse off than a student who did take such a matter to the sexual harassment committee of that same university, the report of which is being suppressed by the administration while confidentiality ensures that he cannot be publicly named and identified? And how worse off is she from the notorious Mathura case of 1972 all those decades ago? of a young girl caught in the travails of Indian law only to find her rapist acquitted because she was not a virgin. I suggest that a genuinely effective practice of justice in India should be ready to play off eclectically as required various systems of regulation against one another depending on the situation. Laws against rules, rules against laws, judicial orders against government, sometimes perhaps none of these. In some, contexts with in some contexts with very strong public cultures of accountability, a small democratic community, like a university department, say, might be able to intervene more effectively than more distant rules or laws. Above all, we should work towards empowering complainants to work out the best way of dealing with situations of sexual harassment or assault. If the existing laws restrict the agency of the complainant, then we need to change them. And perhaps the most important question in this regard, when it comes to India, is why? Why is rape and sexual assault in India dealt with by successive amendments to a 158-year-old colonial law? Instead of continuously tinkering with the existing outdated two century old criminal law on rape, India needs freshly drafted legislation reflecting widest possible consultations amongst the citizenry, especially different sections of the women's movement that reflect contemporary, up-to-date understandings of what constitutes sexual violence. And while that process is on, an urgent requirement is the immediate repeal of section 377 of the Indian Penal Code that criminalizes consensual sex between people of the same sex. The intensity of protests in December led many to wonder whether India would actually see a woman's revolution that brought in a lasting, sweeping set of changes. But even as the protests quieted down, India saw a rise in regressive statements behavior intended to curb women's freedoms under the guise of protection, and across the board, a defense of the status quo and of traditions that continue to ignore women's rights. Rape culture in India is fueled by an acceptance of inequality and of embedded violence. It may be the first time in decades that India is exploring these fault lines within its own society. Fault lines of caste, of class, and gender in such a mainstream and in such a vocal fashion. Can India put an end to the violence that kills women before birth, that keeps unwanted girls in deprivation, that is seen in the high levels of child abuse and domestic violence affecting both boys and girls, and that ultimately leads to this rape culture? So far, it's been hard to even challenge some very small things to argue for the presence of more rather than fewer women on the streets and in public spaces, for instance. Since December 2012, there's also been a cultural shift in India. This is very positive, I feel, 
Many more women now feel entitled to bodily integrity and dignity, and many more men and women are beginning to understand how that changes the texture of the everyday. To increase that shift, there are interesting small-scale public education campaigns. But the government or public education systems haven't adopted these wholly across India quite yet. Delhi police data show that 1,036 cases of rape were reported until the middle of August 2013, as against just 433 cases reported over the same period the year before, so compared to August 2012. This is likely to be in some part due to increased reporting, which would point to a greater sense, a greater understanding of personal rights and more societal support for complainants. India has one of the lowest numbers of judges and police in proportion to population, and this expansion needs financing. Failures to convict rapists are due to institutionalized misogyny to some degree, but they're also due to insufficient competence of police and prosecutors. Some state governments in India have complied with Supreme Court orders that require them to provide survivors of violence with damages, but many survivors and witnesses are forced to withdraw from trials because India doesn't have witness protection laws. Evidence shows that sensitive and competent support for victims of violence leads to increased reporting of crime. There are plans to execute rape crisis centers in India. Many have been established, but again, they haven't been executed throughout India quite yet. It is a few weeks of outrage against hundreds of years of tradition. M.J. Akbar, a veteran commentator, had said after Damini's rape in Delhi in 2012, but this may not be so. The greatest change since 2012 December, I believe, is that there are now many more Indian men and women who believe that the epidemic of sexual violence, feared like polio or smallpox once were, can actually be wiped out someday, wiped out completely. India may not have all the answers yet, but isn't it quite wonderful that the conversation shows absolutely no signs of stopping? Thank you.